Okay, so what I put up here on the board is, first of all, you can see this is the modern square of opposition, right? You have your four propositions, your A, your E, right? Your I and your O. Every S is a P, no S is a P. Some S are P and some S is not a P or some S are not a P, right? And then the modern square, the diagonals are understood to be contradictory. Now in the traditional square, let me move there, right? You can see here the traditional square of opposition. You have the same propositions, A, E, I, and O, except what we've done is we've, we've identified, or Aristotle identifies, logical relationships between the horizontal, this is the contrary up here, and the subcontrary down here, and this is called subalternation, or the subalterns. Now, let me just say a little bit about this, right? It's one thing you should keep in mind, right, is that up here, right, up here what we see, these are the universals, right? Whereas down here, these are the particular propositions, right? The difference we said uh, between the modern square and, and the traditional square is namely that in the modern square of opposition, Boole does not consider these universal propositions, the A and the E, to actually be saying anything about things that exist, namely because you don't have unlimited knowledge. Whereas when you say that some things are the case, some S are P or some S is P, and some S is not P, this does imply existence. Um, but under Aristotle's understanding of the existential fallacy, you only break the existential fallacy if you talk about things that don't exist. So for instance, if I say that unicorns exist, if I say that all unicorns are one-horned animals, right, that would be an A proposition, Aristotle would say this commits the existential fallacy because, a, because unicorns don't exist. The difference between Boole and Aristotle is that Aristotle thinks we can have knowledge between of universals, whereas Boole says we can't. Um, so that will become important, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the universals up here, and the particulars are down here. Now, um, by contrast, you can also see that this side of the proposition, right, over here, these are the affirmatives, right, and let me draw a little square here for you, that the A and the I, these are affirmatives, whereas the E and the O, or negatives, right? Um, so you can see you can divide it both between the quality and the quantity going back to those concepts, okay? Now let me move to my next one so you can see an idea of what the relationships are. And this is somewhat of a mess, but I think you'll understand the idea. So you have your A, your E, your I, and the O, right? The contraries, the, the, the definition of the contrary relationship is that at least one of these is false. And sorry, that's hard to read but at least one of these is false. Um, and they're not both true. The subcontrary, right, is the idea that at least one of them is true, but they're not both false, right? And truth flows downward and falsity flows upward, right? Truth flows downward and falsity flows upward. Right, so you can use this square of opposition to test whether or not propositions are correct. So let me give you an example. And this comes from your book on page 218. All Swiss watches are true works of art, right? Therefore, it is false that no Swiss watches are true works of art, okay? So to evaluate this argument, we begin by assuming that the premise is true. So the first premise, that all Swiss watches are true works of art, what type of proposition is that? Um, that's an A proposition, right? So the contrary, the, the second the conclusion of that immediate inference was that it's false that no Swiss watches are true works of arts. Now that's an E proposition, right? So that means it has a contrary relationship, right? But this is actually what exactly the conclusion says, right? Is that, that it's false, that one of them's true and the other one's false, right? But because they can't both be true. So therefore we can say that that immediate inference argument is actually valid, right? Here's another example. Some viruses are structures that attack C, T cells, right? So that's an I proposition. Therefore, some viruses are not structures that attack T cells. That's an O proposition. So they're saying that the I proposition is true, therefore the O proposition is also true, right? Um, but let's think about it, right? So here the premise and the conclusion are linked by the subcontrary relationship. But if the premise is assumed true, the conclusion actually has a logically undetermined truth value. So the argument's invalid. 
right? It commits the fallacy of the listed subcontract. Now, if you use these relationships wrong, right, or if you make an argument, immediate inference arguments, in which you state things that can't be specifically determined by the contrary, the subcontrary, or the subaltern relations, then you commit fallacies. And these fallacies are accordingly the illicit subcontrary, the illicit subalternation, and the illicit contrary. I take a look at page 218 in your book uh, for examples of these. Right. So I hope you can at least get a sense of how we can use these propositions when we have a statement, we can plug it in and see whether or not it's the case. Right. The, the trickiest part is to remember that um, the subcontrary and the contrary are different in the sense that the contrary says that at least one is false, they can't both be true. And the one on the bottom says at least one of them is true, but they can't both be false. But remember, just because one of them is true and they can't both be false, doesn't necessarily entail that the other one's true, which is why it's technically an undetermined truth value, as the example we gave. Um, so, okay, so I hope that this just seeing it can help you understand it, right? Going back to this picture here, I hope you can see how just seeing this, you can see that it's actually quite brilliant, okay? Um, but the truth is, to really learn how to do it, you just have to practice, right? Um, and oh, I guess I should mention real quick on the subaltern relationship going back to this figure. Truth flows downward and falsity flows upward, right? So if you say all cats are animals and then you have therefore it is true that some cats are animals, this is true on Aristotle's view, right? Because if it's true universally, it would be true in the particular sense. But if I say, for instance, some cats are not dogs, it's always therefore false, right? Or let me say this, right? If I say it's false that some cats um, are are dogs, right? Then it's also false if I say all cats are dogs, right? And a so falsity flows upward, but not the reverse. You can only use the logical relations in terms of how they're specified. Um, you can't imply any more than that, which is the difficult part. I think you'll find when you practice this in your homework that if there's an easy tendency to want to say more than you actually can. Um, so these are the subalterns, and of course the contradictories still apply. Okay.